Hey everybody, really excited to be here and share my story. But before I do, I thought I'd start with a random question. Any homeschoolers in the audience? Oh, yeah, you gotta raise your hand high. Anybody else that homeschooled? How many of you guys know homeschoolers? Yeah, and how many people know the stereotype of homeschoolers? <laughs> so you're currently looking at a homeschooler. Um, My mom actually uh, homeschooled me, not in a, a cool place like Portland or Seattle where I live now, but in rural Idaho, about a half hour from the closest grocery store and about 20 minutes from the closest gas station. So I grew up in the middle of nowhere, and uh, all of the stereotypes about a homeschooler were true in my case. In fact, when I went to school for the first time in seventh grade, there were a bunch of kids that were confused. They wanted to be nice to me because they thought I must have some type of social disability because I couldn't quite fit in. There were another group of kids that were not quite as uh, generous. And I remember one time uh, there was a, a circle of kids and I was trying so hard to fit in. I was maybe in my second or third week ever going to school and they were all laughing about something. And so I joined in and started laughing and I thought about it for maybe like eight or nine hours. What are they laughing about? And I got home that night and I realized they were laughing about how socially awkward I was. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> but um, I actually kind of hit a, a gold mine because I met these two guys that were very socially capable and uh, they mentored me and we started a rock band together. So we all played music and by the end of that seventh grade year, my first year in school, we actually played three shows. The first two were at our friends' houses and our friends thought we were great. And then the third one, we threw this big concert and had all of our friends invite other people. We actually had 300 people show up to our first actual concert as, as 12 year olds in seventh grade. And included in that 300 uh, folk, uh, person crowd were five members of our favorite local rock band in Nampa, Idaho, in this tiny town in Idaho. And they came up to us and they said, hey guys, we'd love for you to start opening for us. We'd like you to go on this tour with us that's coming up. And we were so excited, but we were like, uh, I don't think we can do that. We can't drive. <laughs> and so uh, even though we couldn't drive, they said, well, that's okay, you guys can pay for the gas. And I'm actually the fourth of six kids, so you might ask, where were your parents and all this? The fact that my parents can remember my name is a total miracle. <laughs> and so uh, I actually was propelled into being in my own tiny world in Idaho, a complete superstar from being a complete castaway in about five seconds. And we had this series of incredibly unlikely events where we went from that to going on tour, to touring regular, to being on the radio nationwide, to having people recognize us everywhere we went, places where we had toured, to you know, be going. And our largest show actually we played was at the um, Idaho Fairgrounds. We had 5,000 people show up. And it was one of the best moments of my life. I, I remember it like it was yesterday because we had been on tour for two months. I hadn't seen any of my friends. And while we were gone, our music had just caught fire locally. So I show up, i never seen anything like this before. I'm on stage and there's 5,000 people there. And there's about 1,000 people singing a song back to me that I wrote. And it, just when I thought I could, it couldn't get any better, like we have worked so hard to create this, countless hours, we had a really rough tour and we stopped getting along, we stopped loving each other, we stopped really you know, connecting the way we wanted to. And for us, that's what it was all about. So we got back from a tour and our drummer, who was a, perhaps the most talented member of the band, said, hey guys, it's over, it's done. And all of a sudden, I was back to being that seventh grader that couldn't fit in, that people made fun of in my head, and I was trying to figure out, like, what can I do? And I realized a big part of what I brought to the band was service to others. And I was kind of known as the business person of the band, but I didn't really think of myself that way. And I remember one of my friends from another band sat me down and said, you know what, Dan, you're a pretty good bass player, but the two guys you play music with, they're really exceptional. 
And the chances of you ever finding two people like that to play music with ever again is actually pretty low. But what you brought to the table was you went out there and you hustled and you worked hard and you made it happen. And he's like, that's special. And so I had this huge void in my life that I needed to fill. And I was a junior in high school and we had these businesses. And what I found was there were a lot of independent business owners out there that had so much passion and so much love for their clients, so much in terms of their product, but they were constantly being taken advantage of by big companies. And it was almost like the whole thing was structured against them. So there was a coffee shop owner named Heather in Caldwell, Idaho, and we'd play acoustic shows there. She did so much for us. She cared about us so much. So I decided I was gonna help her and help her redo her, her technical systems, help her redo her phone lines, internets, and also help her redo her point of sale system which is how I found what I do today, credit card processing, because what I found was she was really being taken advantage of by these huge, nameless, faceless companies, and basically every six months they'd add new fees that she couldn't understand, and they would just do anything that they possibly could to take advantage of her. And she had done so much for me that I just wanted to like help her out, and it turned out I was able to help her out a ton, and her business really benefited, and that connection I felt with her, to me, was so much more valuable than any money I could ever make. And so I started to build a business, and I built a small practice through her friends and people she referred me to and people they referred me to. And I helped people with their credit card processing, with their point of sale system, with their gift card system. And I got up to a couple hundred clients, and I just realized I was chasing my tail because Basically, I'd call up and um, how many of you guys have like Comcast or Time Warner or CenturyLink? And how many of you guys feel like that's like a fair prop process that you have? Probably not too many. So just to fill you in on kind of what I did, I'd basically be the guy that would call Comcast for you every six months and try to like wrestle them into treating you fairly. And it was really a losing battle but one where I was making a big impact. So I started building my own product, and finally my freshman year of college, I had my product ready to go. And so all of my consulting clients, which I didn't expect, they were all so connected with me and connected to each other that they decided they were gonna get behind me and actually join my new company and join my new product. And I'll tell you what, that was a really big risk on their part. It took a lot of love, a lot of passion for them to believe in me because here's this 19-year-old kid saying, every dollar that goes through your business electronically, trust me with it and hope that it's gonna work out, I guess. <laughs> to this day, I still think they probably made the wrong decision, but it worked out really well for them. And I'll forever be in debt to all of our clients. And so the business just kept growing. And you know what? I never really thought that making money should be a big priority. And I remember three years in, getting to the point where I was making $30,000 a year and thinking that I was a complete millionaire, the luckiest guy on the planet, because I could go out there, serve these businesses that do so much for our community, and make enough to get by and pay my basic bills. And I just thought, like, how could I have possibly gotten so lucky? This is so amazing. So I kept building my business that way until the end of 2008. And our profit was close to zero, but we had saved up a little bit from the just barely over zero profit that we had made. And in the fourth week of August of 2008, we lost 20% of our revenue overnight. And it was my first recession as an entrepreneur, uh, and, and I really had no idea uh, the impact it could have on our business, because I just wasn't wired to think that way. And so we all of a sudden started losing money every day, and we had about seven months to survive. And so I went a little bit into panic mode, but I said, Dan, you gotta step up. So I got all of our 40 folks in a room and said, hey, if we actually continue to grow and we get together and we work hard with our current growth rate in four to five months, we'll be back in the black and we'll be, you know, we'll have one or two months to go before we lose everything. 
And so we all came together and people started working like crazy. I, for myself, had been working a lot out of the office and working on our products, and I would do that from 7 a.m. until 5, 6 p.m. And then starting at 6 p.m., I'd go out and start selling again. I'd walk into these restaurants and cold call like I used to when I was first starting. And a lot of the restaurant owners were there. They were in survival mode too, so I met them. But there are so many stories like that of us coming together as a team. And I was just one of 40 people that was doing anything that we could to preserve our vision of making the world a little bit more fair for these amazing independent businesses that make it so rich and wonderful for all of us. And I remember the next two years, we were really proud that we did that. We were really proud that we were able to do more with less and survive. And I, I was all high and thinking, this is fantastic because we've recovered, we've survived, things are better than ever. And I remember walking into a parking lot in, in 2010, the parking lot of my office, and I saw a guy that was sitting there taking a break. Do you ever get the feeling like somebody's really pissed at you and you're not sure why? I just had this intuition about this gentleman named Jason that works at Gravity still today that he was really, really angry with me. So I went over to Jason and I said, hey Jason, what's up? And Jason said to me, you know what Dan, you're really, uh, you, you're, you're very proud of the company and all of us and yourself about how frugal we are and how we got through things. I said, yeah. I said, you know what that means to me? What it means to me is that you're actually taking money out of my pocket that I could use to spend, uh, to, to, to spend more time with my nephew who I care about. And you go out there and you're like so happy about it and you're actually like actively hurting me and actively almost robbing from me, but because of the power distance that we have, you know, you can kind of get away with it. And at first I felt like a complete victim, like, oh, I've done so much for these people and this person, and yada, 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 I'm, you know, he's crazy. And I told him, I was like, Jason, you might be right, but you don't think I would do that consciously or on purpose, do you? He said, absolutely, absolutely, I think you are, actually. <laughs> He's like, I bet you're proud about this. So I thought about it for like two or three days, and I, I honestly did not sleep the next two or three days. And I decided that Jason was right. And it, it, was, it was an incredibly painful realization for me to have. And so... I made an initiative that starting that day, I was going to care for the folks that I worked with and invest in them the same way we had invested in our clients. And over the next few years, we actually um, averaged between a 15 and 20 percent raise across the board for our team on average from 2010 until 2015. And what happened was the company became way more successful. And I realize we're in a good macroeconomic environment, but even adjusting for that, the company continued to succeed, and we continued to have this connection with each other where we were all in it together. And it didn't matter what position I was in, and we, we coined this term that's completely revolutionized the company, which is everyone's the CEO. And we had initiatives across the board, largely not directed by me, that we're all going to think, act, and learn as a business owner. And what I realized is, you guys know that phrase, be your own boss? Most of the time when we hear that, we think that means own a business or start a business. And what I realized is, whether we want to admit it to ourselves or not, each of us is our own boss. And each of us is the CEO of our own lives. And the cascade effect on our company, which I think could apply to everyone in this room, is it's not okay to do anything that you're not passionate about. It's not okay to not serve and do everything that you can with passion and love. And it's 100% not okay to ever do something and say, I'm doing this because so-and-so told me to or because I have to, because it's my job. And 
you know, we're lucky here in Portland and folks have come from all over, but a lot of us live in places where that is actually a reality, but yet we shortchange ourselves and we do things that aren't right because our corporate overlords have told us we have to. And so I think this evolution that this conference is all about and that a lot of us are seeing is actually a bottom-up revolution where we realize that we're empowered, that we can actually take control and do the right thing no matter what our circumstances are. Starting in 2015, it had worked so well and we had become so successful but yet there were still people starting out at Gravity that were struggling because in spite of the fact that anyone that had stayed at Gravity was doing really well financially, when we hired people, we were hiring them at competitive market rates. And so for somebody that answers the phone and does customer service and technical customer service, that starting wage was between thirty-five dollars and $40,000 a year. And I was seeing people making thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year go above and beyond do things better than I would do them, and really be an example and be part of this culture. And I realized we were still kind of getting away with something because we had such a great culture and such great connection with each other. And I realized I could probably keep getting away with it, but what I said was I started my business because I wanted to stick up for the little guy. I wanted to help independent businesses. And then that grew to, well, actually, the folks at Gravity are the little guy, too. And did I really mean that? Or was I like everybody else? And so, to me, the fact that I could get away with paying people a lot less and raking it in for myself did not mean that that was okay to do. And I realized it was a character test. And it was a test of, did I actually believe what I said I believed? I put it all together on a hike on a Sunday. Everybody, I really encourage outdoors, hiking, give yourself time, really helps with creativity. In this case, the creativity wasn't so good because it was like guilt and conviction creativity. (laughs) But I realized I could do it. And for the next two weeks, every day, I woke up with night terrors. Damn, forget this dumb idea. Don't do it. Everything is so good, you're going to completely screw it up. Why would you do this to yourself? But I knew it was the right thing to do. And I knew that it wasn't something that I could do. I knew it was something that I had to do. So we put the policy into place. And I determined that by inviting a few press folks, Maybe I could pay for 10% of the cost of it. Because as an entrepreneur, I want to do all these great things, but I have to find a way to pay for them. The money doesn't come out of thin air. And so we invited the New York Times to come and cover it, as well as NBC News. The New York Times was a little sneaky. They had pre-written the entire article somehow and pieced it together from previous articles, not even interviews or talks they had had from us, but we had given them the headline. And the, the, the moment I announced it to my staff, the New York Times article was live within 10 minutes of announcing it. And it was a, a big, long article above and below the fold on the front page. But it was on the web 10 minutes after I announced it. And an hour later, somebody's like, Dan, uh, your article's number one on Hacker News. And then another hour later, they're like, Dan, your article's number one on Reddit. And another hour later, our article was number one on Facebook, Twitter, and we had turned them into Ganem style overnight. (laughs) And then, you know, I thought, I finished it up. And my expectation is, okay, I've done all the press stuff. I want to get back to work. I don't want to be up here a whole lot more than I already am. So I want to get back to work. And I was sitting there, and my phone was ringing off the hook with 212. Manhattan area codes that ended in all zeros, and it was all the biggest media companies in the world. But what was bigger than that was I had friends of friends of friends of friends of friends t- telling me indirectly, I had friends telling me that we're hearing, we're hearing this multiple derivative that 
my Facebook doesn't work, my Twitter doesn't work, why is this guy every single post on the internet right now? It doesn't make any sense. And I had never seen anything like it before and being in it, it was so different. And then they're like, oh Dan, uh, you need to get on the next plane to New York because Matt Lauer wants to talk to you in the morning. And of course, I have no idea what's going on. And now I'm faced with the interesting dilemma which is there's been this incredible response to what I did, which I just wanted to do for our 120 some folks at Gravity, find a way to pay for it, that I'm left grappling having no idea what is my moral and ethical responsibility with this opportunity. Because where a lot of responsibility comes from is what is the opportunity in front of you? And Clearly, it's something big and hard to grasp. It's this huge opportunity, and clearly, I have this huge responsibility now to try to help and to try to lead, but I don't know exactly how to do that. So I came here to talk to all you guys and have you maybe give me some advice, give me some ideas, and it's been about two months now, and it's been, it's been fun and exciting, but a little overwhelming. My lifestyle was kind of figured out before all that, and now it's like really you know, chaotic and overwhelming. But the response has been so inspiring for us. And we've just enjoyed being a part of these conversations. And I've heard uh, from hundreds and hundreds of CEOs that they've redone their pay policy, or they're investing more into training. And people ask me, Dan, do you want companies to follow suit? And the answer to that is, it's not about money. When they asked Che Guevara, who a lot of people in this room might consider one of the most brutal terrorists in the history of the world, what do you look for in a guerrilla fighter? What do you look for in a freedom fighter? What's the number one trait? Anyone want to make a guess what Che Guevara said? Love. It was love. And that's really where we can follow suit, is this passion for other people, this passion to help. And my 40-year vision, which I, I articulated for the first time about five years ago, is to be a part of a revolution where business and commerce and the way we interact on that level ceases to be about money and ceases to be about who can get the most of this quantifiable asset of how many of these little notes with president's faces on it can I get and starts being about how can we serve others? How can we create global change? How can we create connection? How can we solve the most important problems out there today? And I have that big vision juxtaposed with my day job which is, how can I get another merchant to trust me with their credit card processing? <laughs> There's a pretty big gap between those two. But I found a way to create harmony and to see them as the same thing. And I would love and encourage you all to think, what's the one thing between now and when your career ends or when your life ends that if you accomplished, you'd be willing to sacrifice everything else? What's your one thing like my one thing is? And how can you create harmony and connection to what you do every day and that one thing? Thank you very much.